Make sure you stay tuned to the very end of this video where I talk about my starting seven players from high Q all the way up through season three. What's up guys, this is Coach Donnie from Elevate Yourself, where we change lives through volleyball, training, and inspirational content. Welcome to my volleyball coach reaction to OVA Path of the Ball. If you're new to this channel, I'm a volleyball coach, volleyball player, and personal trainer who provides volleyball tutorials, jump training workouts, and other cool volleyball videos. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok for more content. Thanks for explaining the analogy between land versus air, how Fukuda Dani is the owl representing the offense and Nekoma's mascot is the cat representing defense. I knew it had something to do with some type of defense versus offense. I appreciate the detailed explanation between which teams are going to nationals and why there are still more teams competing for spots at nationals. This seems pretty standard for most high school tournaments, especially if you're a hosting team you usually get an automatic bid to play in the tournament as a courtesy for hosting the tournament. And then the larger regions usually allowing for more spots because they have more schools competing in that region. I completely forgot that I was gonna mention the result of my girls high school volleyball game against Logan High School during a couple reaction videos ago when I was reacting to the game between Karosuno and Shua Toizawa. So I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. There's been a long history between Karosuno and Shua Toizawa and Shua Toizawa being the longtime powerhouse and Karasuno just kind of being like a mid-level tier team, never really making it to nationals or at least historically losing a nationals, but still not being a title contender. That's very similar to the high school that I'm currently coaching at, which is Moreau Catholic High School, when we played the powerhouse of our league, which is James Logan High School. The last time Moreau Catholic beat James Logan was seven years ago. And just a couple weeks ago, we finally beat them. This is my first full year coaching at Moreau Catholic, and it feels amazing to already help this program achieve some historic moments. I don't remember the last time I actually ran onto the court with that much excitement. So that moment reminded me of where Karasuno overcame so many odds to be able to finally defeat Shira Toizawa. And the emotion that they displayed during that win was the same emotion that I felt where I was almost brought to tears with this level of an accomplishment with the Moreau Catholic program. Just goes to show how realistic Q is in terms of all the mini stories, the personalities, and the battles that happen on the volleyball court, as well as the coaches and players' emotional reactions from these type of powerful experiences. If you've been enjoying my videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you receive exclusive access to my monthly live Q&A sessions, monthly podcasts, my private blog, behind the scenes footage, and more. Now let's get this high Q party started. Whose shadows are those? Class one through five. I wonder what they mean by class one through three. Maybe this is a flashback to when they were younger. Oh, yes, the middle school rivalries continue. That must be the setter. <laughs> Healthy competition. Alright, let's go back to watch some of the animation. This is how you can tell that there's a little bit lower quality of animation or the animators aren't as skilled. If you observe the proportions, if you look at the brown haired guy, I think that's the setter. His arms, I know they're bent up, but they're almost as long as the torso. And if you look at body proportions, if you just stand up and see how long your, your arms hang, your fingers generally go to mid thigh or at least to your groin. And so his elbow should be further back to show the length of that. And then you look at the proportions of Kuro, I think that's his name. Same thing, torso is a little bit long, the head's really small. And I know sometimes in anime, the proportions are exaggerated, but this is not like a, I guess a good exaggeration. And we'll see here, another sign of animation or quality animation is if only one part of the body is moving and the rest of it is still, that's what I call lazy animation. 
and I'm not trying to be super critical of here, but just trying to show you some observations of how to spot, like maybe if you're watching something and you wonder what's off about the animation or it doesn't look as good, these are usually the reasons why. So I'm gonna replay this clip here and you'll see how one body will move and then like the eyes or the mouth will move and then the body will move and then this will move. Usually good animation, you'll have multiple moving parts and that sounds a lot easier said than done but it's really hard to do and I completely understand why a lot of animators don't spend the time doing that. So you see how his mouth is moving but none of the body part is moving. And it might zoom forward and then only the, the eyes or other things are moving. And a scene like this, this is actually okay because the drawing is really great. The throat and the chin and the mouth are moving even though the eyes might not be. But sometimes if it's just the mouth but nothing else is moving, it just looks kind of odd. Because you'll see how even when I'm talking here, my jaw, my cheekbones, even if you just draw a couple wrinkle animations to kind of squiggle, that, that does a lot more in terms of communicating the quality of movement. Yes, food. Always center around food. Fish and meat. Uh -huh. <laughs> this must be one of the original upperclassmen for Nekoma, mentoring these two leaders, future leaders of Nekoma. Ski. <laughs> <laughs> they are so opposite. This is awesome. Cats. I love it. This is this is great to have this type of healthy competition within the team. Very similar to Hinata and Kageyama. Very different personalities, but both highly competitive and common volleyball goals, at least. Here we have that intense intro to the path of the ball, OVA. Wonder what they mean by path of the ball. There's the Tanaka lookalike. Yeah, that's right, flying over the barrier, my dream. Love crushing it. Once you've tasted your first overpass kill, you are hooked. And that's all it takes is that one time to, to synchronize your body to know how to do it again. And then the libero was injured, I remember. Oh no, that sucks. All that force onto the ankle. Uh oh. Not good. Shibayama! Shibayama! That's the risk of going all out, is you might injure yourself. Those are some encouraging words from the leader. Wait, they're, that's the same, he's not an upperclassman. I think they're all the same year, all first years. Oh, the libero was the one that was talking in the beginning when they had that flashback. Yeah, that sucks to be able to happen in such an important game. But Nikoma doesn't look bothered at all. This guy looks like Rock Lee. Deep breath. He looks pretty confident, which is good. Self talk. <laughs> right away, they signal him for some trash talking. Yeah, the way this animator is drawing, everyone looks a lot more muscular. Yeah, never mind what I said about the confidence. Ooh, good job cushioning the ball. I got overpowered. The stare down. Now he looks like Mega Man. 
Kind of had the same look, Mega Man and Rock Lee. Who's bringing down the mood? That's why you need a gamer on the team to look at things objectively and come up with a game plan while everyone else is trying to have some type of emotional pep talk and reaction. Is he calling the shots here? Oh, keeping Kuro in, the experienced player. I have a story to share. 2014, when I was coaching at another high school, Mission San Jose High School, before I recently transferred to Moreau Catholic, we had a really good team that year. And our starting libero, her name was Molly, she was really, really good. I mean, probably the best libero I've ever coached, period. She wasn't lightning fast, she wasn't lightning athletic, she just had incredible control of the ball, and her ability to read the situation was impeccable. Molly, if you're listening out there, sorry for putting your skeletons out there, uh, but she did start off with the attitude problem, and then she matured a lot toward the end of the season, so she has a great attitude now. But going back to the story, we were playing against, I think Moreau Catholic, ironically. We, we won the first two sets, and I remember in the first set, she wanted to play middle back defense because left back defense wasn't exciting enough for her. And usually we have our outside hitters playing middle back because we want them to hit a pipe, which is a middle back attack in transition. And also our outside hitters had pretty good defense. I made a deal with her, I said, okay, and sometimes you have to compromise with your players if you really want to get them locked on the same page as you. I said, how about you play middle back half the time and then during the other half when our freshman outside hitter is back row, you can play middle back because the freshman outside hitter is not going to be as experienced. So that was a compromise. But during the game, she was still kind of pouty and still acting like she wanted to play full time middle back. And even though we won the first set, I talked to her, I said, Hey, if you don't improve your attitude, I'm just going to take you out. We've already made some type of compromise and this is as good as it's going to get. The team success has to have a greater priority over your own. So you know, be careful. Second game, she continues with the bad attitude and then we win the second one pretty easily. So we're on route to win 3-0, but as a coach, I have to stand by my word and we can't tolerate attitudes on the team. So what I do is I actually sit her, I put her on the bench, and then I actually have my backup libero, Connie, come in. Now Connie's only a sophomore and she's actually very talented, but she's still lacking in some experience and confidence. So we try her the third set. She unfortunately just cracks under pressure. She's way too nervous, she shanks a lot of balls, and she just can't handle the pressure. So we end up losing the third set with her as libero. And on a side note, Connie ends up becoming another spectacular libero later in her career, her junior and senior year. So Connie, if you're listening, don't worry. <laughs> I made sure people know how good you were. Uh, you were just a little shaky your sophomore year, if you remember. So fast forward to the fourth set. I look over at Molly and she's still pouting on the bench. I'm like, all right, I'm not gonna put her in. There's no point in rewarding this type of attitude. I want to show the team that this is not how we operate on the team. You have to be a team player. So then I put our middle to play all the way around. Her name is Michelle, and she was she's a really, really good middle. She's only five foot six, but she jumps really high, she works her butt off, and she actually has pretty good ball control. And more importantly, she was a junior that year, I think, and she's just not afraid. Like, pressure doesn't really get to her. She's kind of the same all around. So I talked to Michelle, I said, all right, Michelle, I'm gonna have you go all the way around, you get passed. And she goes, yay, and she puts her thumbs up. And she's not worried about what's happening, even though we just lost that third set. And then I think I only have Connie play half the time. So then we barely lose the fourth set. And then I look over to my assistant coach and I say, I'm willing to lose this game to prove a message that we cannot have attitudes on the team. And more importantly, you have to put the team's success above your own. So in the fifth set, it was super close. Michelle dials in her defense 
and Connie is able to barely play well enough to kind of get by halftime and we end up winning in the fifth set. It was a crazy game and I remember looking over to the bench and Molly just looked really disappointed and sad. She went from looking pouty and angry to being really sad and I think at that moment she realized that wow this team doesn't need me even though we actually really did. <laughs> we really needed Molly, but of course I'm not going to tell her that because I want her to learn that lesson. I want that experience to really sink in. And I think in that moment she thought, well, this team doesn't really need me. I have to choose to be a part of the ex experience. And it's not what this team can do for me. It's what can I do for the team because this team's going to succeed with or without me. So after that moment, her attitude got so much better and she turned it around. And to further cement the message, the very next game, we started with the same defensive group, had, Co had Connie play halftime libero and had Michelle go all the way around. And we continued to struggle because those aren't our best passers. And the reason why I kept it the same is because Connie and Michelle earned that opportunity to start as back row players. And as we continue to struggle, then eventually I put Molly back in once Michelle and Connie kind of met their limit defensively. So this totally reminds me of that moment when I made the same coaching move. Although I think it's ironic that Ken Ma is calling the shot and not the coach. So I wonder what the reason behind that dynamic is. Yes, the flames wanting to prove yourself. Who's Yaku Paisen? I'm assuming that's Kuro. Maybe that's his, his first name or formal name. Even though I'm not a fan of their style of having a trash talk all the time, I like where that desire comes from because these guys are highly competitive. That's like the slowest jump float. Come on, Kuro. Falling forward. Sometimes just falling forward, good things happen. Ooh, and Lev gets a crush. Nice rush, Nice the most important thing is even if you're diving, you're confident in your movements. Chance ball. Chance ball. Oh, he's calling a chance ball on a service C. That's trash talking. Kuro's gonna take away that angle right away. Yes. Kuro coming in clutch. Compensating for the weaknesses of the team. That's a leader. What more can Kuro do? Maybe offensively. Oh, only one point game. Didn't realize it was so close already. Oh, he's gonna serve at Shibuyama. Wise words from the starting libero. Prove your worth. Don't just be the short player that gets relegated to libero. I love how they dive deep into these mental moments, these thought processes that these players are going through. Oh, he dimes it. Let's go over that technique there. Shibayama exemplifies great passing technique. So on a tough jump serve, you might not be able to move your feet too much, but the key thing is you want to position your body behind the ball before you put your platform together. Most passers make the mistake of forming the platform first and then moving. And what that causes you to do is it causes you to get handcuffed or what I call getting handcuffed. So if I lock my hands too early and then try to move, I'm now carrying all this lateral momentum to the ball and that was what causes the ball to go side to side. 
It also slows you down. I think we can all agree that you move a lot faster and more efficiently when your hands are apart. If you handcuff yourself, it's like moving with two logs in front of you. So make sure you position your body as best as you can before you actually form your platform. See how he's positioning his body behind the ball, then he forms his platform and he gets nice and low. And then easy conversion for Kuro. Oh, great line hit. Look at those quadricep muscles. I think the still images for this animator is really good. He's just, or she, the animator is describing the musculature much better than previous animators. However, when it comes to fast motions, the proportions are still a little off. So still image, great job. So the pose is spot on, all the wrinkles are great. Look at the musculature of the forearm, the bicep. So once again, another great illustration for a still image, but in motion, the proportions are kind of funny. If you look at Kuro compared to Kenma, yes, Kuro is taller, but the head is just a little too large and the the torsos are still too long usually for to make someone look taller you want the torsos to be shorter because longer legs and a smaller head are what communicate height here the animator does the opposite larger head longer torso makes the character look short even though it's he's physically longer than kenma he still feels short and from what i remember kudo is actually pretty tall Kuguri, you gotta remember that name. あいつ俺より上よ。そんなことはないっすよね、マサ。今回は稽古で仕事なく。監督はやる気全面に出してる奴には好きだけど、クグリは感情が見えづらい。それで損してるとこあるだろ。でも技術はあいつの方が上だと
Admitting to the own touch and calling it to the ref, that's rare. That must be a Japanese thing. In the coma still up by one. Oh, pinch server. Oh, this was the guy that was talking on the sideline for heavy. Top spin. Oh, great graphic with the lightning going through his face. Fukunaga. That was close. Yeah! Poor Fukunaga. Oh, interesting. They are the, the sneakiest team. You know, I can't blame them for cheating. I mean, people that really want to win, you, you got to admire that they're doing, they're, they're willing to do a lot of things to try to win. It's just a misguided desire. I'd rather have someone try too hard to win than for someone to not try at all. It's a much better problem to deal with. It's hard to coach somebody to want something. It's much easier to coach somebody to refine what they want. Nagi wants to win with true skill. Wow. Powerful ace. Oh, heavy up by one now. I like this guy's determination. He's just on the bench. Can he make this one in? Oh, they, okay, they caught it in. Nice dose. Man, he did his job. Served three times. I'm gonna put my money that Nikoma wins just because they're one of the main teams there. And also, Hinata and Kenma are friends, so storytellers probably want to play on that dynamic more. Oh, but we got Kuro serving. Nice receiver! That sucks. Jamming the finger. That's happened many times. Oh. Come on, Shibayama. Show him what Mega Man can do. Nah, Rock Lee. He looks like Rock Lee. I'm gonna call him Rock Lee from now on. Oh, I love the confidence. He's saying, I got your back, middle. You block and I dig. Lev is just going off. He's gonna drop it, close it. Oh, who is gonna see it? Oh, Shibuyama, did he get it? No. I remember. The serving specialist was talking about how Kuguri has good skill, but he tends to be non-emotional. That's actually a really good quality to have for one of the players. Now, if all your players lack emotion or don't get super excited, that's not a good thing. Same thing on the token where if all your teammates and all your players get excited, that's also not a good thing. You want to have some type of balance. So it's great that the other team has energy and it's good that Kugiri is kind of the calm player because you want to have them to balance each other out. When the team wants to get too riled up, Kugiri is going to be the stabilizing force. And when things get dead, you don't want to look to Kugiri for energy. You want to look to your normal teammates for that fiery energy to get your team going. The fist pump. 
すみません次次次一本反応できない一方俺じゃないよく見るんだ Yeah, he formed this platform too early and then swung to the side. You gotta form it one motion behind the ball. You don't want a golf swing. Maybe he's gonna coordinate more with his libero saying, I'm gonna block this and you dig this. Connect the two. Very true. It's about how do you make your teammate better with what you do. Wow, it's a Suki moment for... This is a Suki moment for Lev. Exactly like Tanaka. That was a short serve there. That quick, that's pretty impressive. Tanaka. This is an exciting play here. Lots of hard hits and digs. Beautiful animation of those hands. Let's see where his instincts are right. Oh, because he's aiming for the weaker defender, Shibayama, but he directed him right to him. Oh, high swing off the tool. Can they pull a... No, they can't pull a Nakoma Libero move. That was a good rally to end on. Good job, Nakoma. I'm gonna clap like the coach. <laughs> That's trust in your teammates. Cannot single handedly win. Mm -hmm. Great words from Kuro. That's right, Lev didn't even touch the ball, but he directed it to Shibuyama. And at the end of the day, if you score the point together, that feels the best than trying to win the game on your own. That has a beautiful graphic right there. This guy's a really, really good illustrator, not as strong of an animator. That's got to be one of the proudest moments as one of the team leaders. Even when you get injured, knowing that your team is strong enough without you. I want to expand further on that. There's two types of leaders out there. Leaders that want to take all the glory and want the team to be dependent on them and want to be the reason why the team is good. Or great leaders who focus on how to make the team better and the goal is to be so good that the team doesn't need you. I know that sounds kind of ironic, but I can tell these leaders on Nikoma are really true leaders at heart and not just the best players on the team. Because when you spend more time making your teammates better with encouragement, with feedback, with energy, with, with systems, like how Lev was trying to implement a system where he'd block one way and then direct the ball easily to Shibuyama, you get so much more out of your team that way. Compare the opposite, like what if the libero always said, hey, don't block, let me dig him. I'm gonna dig him, I'm gonna pass every ball. You don't get, you're not a good passer, right? That's one way to be a leader, but that's 
not really good leadership. So the fact that the starting libero can step out and have faith in his team is more of a reflection of his leadership and all the things he's helped his team accomplish in the past couple months leading up to this big moment. So for all those young players out there, this that's the type of leader you wanna be. You don't wanna be the type of leader that the team depends solely on your performance. How can you make your team better? Kuguri with tears, even though it's not very emotional. Yeah. Seeing emotion is encouraging because it shows how much he cares too. Yeah, one day Lev's gonna dominate. お前、下手くそには下手くそって言ってやれよ。Great camaraderie with the players who are in the same class. Who's Mika-chan? Ex-girlfriend? And now she regrets breaking up with him because he saw how cool he was playing on the court. Yeah, it is a life-changing experience when you really commit yourself to being great at something. Sukuridani down, loses to Itachiyama. Now we get to see the final brackets. Alright, gotta pause this. So, first slot is to Itachiyama. Gotta practice these names because I'll be saying them a lot in Season 4. Fukuradani, number two, and then Nikoma. So Nikoma didn't really have to win because they were going to be in the tournament anyway because it looks like they were hosting it or sponsoring the event. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. That was a good ending. Here's my immediate reaction to OVA Path of the Ball. I'm still not sure why they call it Path of the Ball. They have so many flashbacks that I think every episode can be called Path of the Ball because everyone has their own individual journey. So if you guys want to explain why it's called Path of the Ball, let me know in the comments. I'm still mind blown at how many mini stories that Haikyuu offers and how many different circumstances that happen, whether it's a libero getting injured, Daichi getting injured, a libero having to play halftime, and then the other middle playing full time. Like those are all things we haven't seen yet. And there's infinite possibilities. And for them to include such a variety of circumstances really makes this story so engaging and very realistic as you saw by my personal story of when I had to make my middle play full time and the second libero play half time. I'm definitely excited to get season 4 started. Now to officially end season 3, now we're going to go over my starting 7 or my new starting 7 since the last time I talked about this was at the end of season 2 but now we've seen so many new characters and I've gotten a chance to see all the Karasuno players develop up to this point. Before I get into it, I want you to write down your starting seven and compare that to my starting seven, or you can also try to predict who my starting seven would be and see if it matches up. If you do get to predict my starting seven, put a thumbs up in the comments and I'm going to give you a good job comment. I'm going to start with the most obvious position, which is the opposite hitter, and a reason why I call it the obvious position because Ushijima is hands down the best player that we've seen so far. He is the most powerful hitter, very dependable. You can give him any type of set and he's going to do something great with it. He's also a lethal server and the bonus with Ushijima is that he plays defense. He's also a pretty good leader on the court, another style of leadership that we haven't seen from any other team. He's pretty black and white, doesn't really get riled up except for when he plays Hinata. Hinata seems to get under his skin, but very steady force and you need someone like that. Kind of similar to 
I already forgot his name. The guy on the previous team, the green and yellow team we saw, where they're just emotionally very steady. And he's just an imposing force. And he is like another level of ace. Not only is he powerful, but his determination and his aura that he gives off. That's why I want him on my team. For starting setter, I gotta go with my guy Kageyama. He takes a lot of risk as a setter, and in order to play at the highest level, you do need to have a simple setting plan, but then there are moments to get an extra edge against a good team. You need to take some risk, whether it's setting against the flow, setting a quick set beyond the three meter line, or just going all out for a ball. He ironically touches the highest on the entire Karasuno team, so he's got a really good reach, he's got a great jump serve, as we saw, he dug Ushijima pretty easily, so he's got the defense down. But he's a true competitor. He's always trying to find ways to win, and he might be one of the most competitive people in Haikyuu, probably top five for sure. Now imagine if Kageyama was able to run the same fast offense that he does with Hinata, but with Ushijima. That would be an unstoppable offense if Ushijima always had one blocker up or half a blocker up all the time. For Libero, I'm still sticking with my boy Nishinoya. Every season, Nishinoya shows his worth. Initially, he was just this crazy Libero that all he did was pass, and then he got super hyped and found ways to get his team pumped up. And we saw against the match uh, when they played Shiotori Zawa, how he was the true rock of the team. That when his team was getting discouraged, when Daichi was even at a loss for words, he empowered his team and says, I will find a way to get our team back on track. I am not going to let the ball hit the floor. And most importantly, he was not afraid of Ushijima. In fact, the better the servers and the hitters are, the better he wants to play. And that's the type of person that you want to have on your team that is going to rise to the occasion and not get intimidated by the pressure. He's also a great jump setter, so he can still run an in-system offense if he has to set. So you have the maybe the only libero who can dig Ushijima as well as the, the best hitter in the team, that's, that's a lethal combination. For my first middle, I'm going with Kuro. Even before this OVA episode, I was pretty certain I would choose him for my team because he's just another calm, confident leader. He's also a great teacher and nurturer. He's almost like a father figure that's not as old, but like a young father and an older brother type that is really great at mentoring people and teaching people how to be better. He's a great read blocker, so you have the instincts of Pendo, but with the thoughtfulness of Tsuki, and that's a good combination. And during the OVA episode, we saw that he's got pretty good defense and is a good back row option. So when he goes and serves and he's got a good serve, he can be a live option so that you don't have to set Ushijima all the time, and he's pretty effective on that back row quick. For my second middle, I'm still going with the big guy, Aone. I still yet to see another dominant blocker so far, and also a middle that just has such an imposing presence. The animation of him just crowding the ball and just kind of creeping over and blocking out the entire world when he's about to block a hitter, still, that, that scene still stains my mind. And also to meet a middle blocker that is that obsessed about blocking every single ball. And the best analogy I can give, Aone is like Nishinoya is for liberos as Aone is for middles. What I mean by that is, Nishinoya's primary existence in life is to keep the ball off the floor and to connect the team. That goal just consumes his life. And Aone's goal is to never let a ball get past him and that consumes his whole existence. He can have some offense, but most of the offensive load in the middles can be taken care of by Kuro and then Aone is just gonna block lights out. Plus, I think him and Hinata would form a really unique bond because they are kinda cute friendship, but then when they're on the team, I think they'll find a way to make each other even better. For my first outside hitter, I'm going with Asahi. Ever since Asahi had that breakthrough moment where he just busted through the gates against a triple block and redeemed himself, he just continues to grow more and more dependable, and he has that same imposing will as Ushijima, where he's gonna demand the ball and he's gonna say, I'm gonna put this ball away for the team. Even though there are more skilled players like Bokuto and Leon who can probably do some more technically tricky things and more advanced techniques, Asahi has a different level of determination when it comes to scoring a point. 
He's also just as effective back row as he is front row, and he has a great connection with Kageyama. For my second outside hitter, and I saved this one for last, I'm going with Hinata. I know Hinata is usually a middle, but I think he would make a great outside hitter and would be very complimentary to Asahi. So Asahi and Ushijima usually need a slightly higher set because they're bigger and more physical and you want to let your big hitters rise to the ball and you don't want to rush them too much because if they can hit at their peak with peak power, they're going to be unstoppable. Hinata, on the other hand, benefits more from a faster type of set. So imagine if you're blocking against this team, you have to wait to block Asahi and Ushijima, but then you have to jump early and commit with Hinata. So you can run Hinata as fast as your middles, both from the front row and the back row. And the great thing about Hinata is you can run them on combinations. So you can keep Ushijima and Asahi as a predictable high ball left and right. And then when Hinata gets into the front row, you can run them on the A quick, the B quick, X plays, any type of combination you want. So you get the benefit of having two decoys from the middle and Hinata to open it up for everybody else, whether it's hitting from the back row from Asahi or the front row for Ushijima on the right side. The only weakness of this team is going to be serve-receive. Asahi is a pretty decent passer. We know that Nishinoya is a spectacular passer, but that third passing slot is going to be in question. Hinata, we all know, is not the best at passing. Now, Ushijima, we could put him in there. We didn't get a chance to see him with serve-receive passing very much, but I would probably do either a four-man receive where Asahi and Nishinoya pretty much take up 30 or 40% each, and then Hinata and Ushijima both take up like a 10% slot. Or you do like a 40-40 split between Asahi and Nishinoya. And then either Ushijima or Hinata would take up that 20% slot. So pretty much find a way to hide the weaker passer and make sure Asahi and Nishinoya pass majority of the court. Let me know in the comments below what you think of my starting 7. And also what your starting 7 would be up through Season 3. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We'll see you all in season four.